Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Great news. You can now watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube Movies and Shows. Treatment of chronic health conditions can be extremely frustrating for both patients and conventional doctors. Today's guest, Clearwater, Florida, integrative physician, Dr. David Minkoff, MD, uses a different approach to help his patients. Dr. Minkoff has developed unique and effective treatment protocols for a variety of health conditions, such as Lyme disease, cancer, autoimmune conditions, heart conditions, chronic fatigue, and more. Dr. Minkoff is a triathlete and best-selling author. Please pick up his book, In Search for the Perfect Protein, but his ultimate goal is to create a healthy society. Dr. Minkoff has a unique ability to explain complex medical issues in a simple and fascinating way that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Dr. Minkoff, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Carrie. Good to be here. Well, I, I really appreciate it. I love watching you, your, your little talks, your lectures. I've learned so much over the years being involved in integrative medicine. But why did you decide to get involved in integrative med medicine to help your patients? Well, I did traditional medicine for a long time before I got started. I was, uh, I was board certified as a pediatrician, then I did a fellowship in infectious disease, and I was a hospital-based infectious disease doctor. And then I switched careers and uh, started doing emergency medicine. And my wife, who's a nurse, uh, had some health problems that weren't really being helped very well. And she started searching for answers for people. And she found Jeff Bland. And she came home from a meeting, a seminar, and she said, uh, Jeff Bland is a, was a professor of, of biochemistry. Um, he worked with Linus Pauling. Um, and so one weekend, she dragged me to a, a weekend seminar with Jeff. Uh, in Orlando, and I thought it was, he's probably the smartest person I ever, I ever met. Uh, just, a, you know, a true um, eidetic memory, like he, he could always, he could quote you, he had, he had at the time, and I don't know if he's still doing this, but he had, he had the largest personal medical library, journal library of anyone in the country, like tens of thousands of journals which he'd all read because he would spend three hours every morning reading. He could read 1500 words a minute and he could quote you page and issue number of anything that you asked him about. And that impressed me. So uh, I like smartness and he was like the epitome. So he had a podcast then it was, it wasn't a podcast, but it was a functional medicine update. And he'd spend three hours on a subject every month. 
And it got me kind of interested. And then I um, was trying to help my wife solve her problems. And it, it all started after she'd had her mercury removed improperly by a dentist. So she's getting into health. She has uh, 16 amalgam fillings in her mouth since young childhood. And she was learning about health and she went to a dentist in St. Petersburg, just close to us, who wasn't a, a biological dentist and he drilled them all out. No protection for him, no protection for her. And she got a bunch of autoimmune things turn on with her thyroid, her liver, her nervous system. And um, so sort of serendipitously a next to, so she's a nurse and she owned a, excuse me, home healthcare nursing business. And next door, a guy moved in while she was in the middle of this thing, going to see various doctors to try to help her problem. And on his marquee, it said, it said um, natural dentistry. And so one day I was going to pick her up and I stopped and he was walking out of his office door and I stopped and introduced myself and asked him like, what is natural dentistry? And he said, well, unlike normal dentists or regular dentists, we believe that the mouth is part of the body. <laughs> and kind of like the eyes. Kind of like the eyes. And if you do, and like arms and legs and livers and kidneys, and you know, you shouldn't do things in the mouth that you wouldn't do in the body. Like, would you put mercury in a wound? You know, would you, you know, you just wouldn't do that. Would you leave in a dead organ? Like if you had a dead organ, if you had a gangrene, gangrenous toe or some gangrenous bowel, you have to get it out. And he said, dentists do root canals and they leave in dead organs, dead infected organs. So I'm like, like, wow, this is interesting. I mean, this is a totally new concept to me. And then I told him that my wife had had all this mercury removed and she wasn't feeling well. And without any hesitation, he said, oh, she's mercury toxic. Now I'd never heard of mercury toxicity. I never thought of it. And he said, this is like 1995. Uh, and he said, you know, nobody around here is gonna help you. He said, there's a guy in, in Seattle, Washington, who's a doctor and he's got a PhD and he trains other doctors in natural detoxification and heavy metal toxicity. And he does courses for doctors. So I went home, I looked it up. I think two weeks later, he had a weekend seminar and I flew to Seattle and I did the seminar and I had my eyes just opened up totally, just remarkably wide because this guy isn't a quack. He wasn't doing what seemed to me voodoo medicine, but he was very knowledgeable and I learned a whole bunch of stuff from him. And then a couple of weeks later, I went back and I did like three, four courses with him. And I came back and I started applying this to my wife's condition. Now I'm doing regular emergency medicine at this time. I'm in a big community hospital. It's a chest pain center, it was one of the top hundred chest pain centers in the country. And I was doing shift work, you know, seven in the morning till seven at night or seven at night, seven in the morning. And I started to play around with the stuff I'd learned. And lo and behold, over about four or five months, all her symptoms went away and she got better. And we had friends who were watching this whole thing and they started to call me and say, hey, you know, I've got migraine headaches. I've got ulcerative colitis. I've got rheumatoid arthritis. I've got blah, blah, whatever they did. Will you help me? And I said, well, I don't know if I'm really qualified to help you. I got a success you know, I have one patient and it worked, uh, but I have Tuesday afternoons off and if you want to come over. And so in her clinic, in her home health clinic, she had an extra room that they weren't using. And I set up a little, a little office there. And I said, come on over there. I'm not going to charge you because I'm really not sure I know what I'm doing, but we can play. And the stuff I learned actually really worked. And people started to get better. And then the word of mouth just exploded. And within a few months, we actually renovated. There was an empty space on the other side of the dentist. And we renovated a 3,000 square foot there. And we opened up. And I, was, I transitioned over, it was probably six or eight months later, I transitioned out of emergency medicine because the stuff I was doing was so interesting and so exciting um, and I was just, it just was natural for me. And so we did that for a year, the clinic filled up and then we moved across a little bit, a 
few blocks away. And, you know, now we have five buildings and a lot of space and 75 employees and, you know, three MDs, four nurse practitioners. So we have a big place now. It's one of the biggest places in the country. And we're doing the same thing. We're treating people to make them healthy. Um, most of our patients are, our average patient has been to 13 doctors. So these people have been through the mill and have not gotten help. And that's really our specialty. So it's cancer and Lyme disease and chronic neurological diseases. And it's very exciting. It's very fun. And we really help people. And about 85% of the people that we see of this troubled group. So, you know, you've seen 13 doctors and you're not better to take about 85% of them and really help them, you know, to their satisfaction that we really helped them and got better is pretty good. So that's what I do for fun now. So let me ask you a question about the, about the root canals and uh, cavitations. Now, is root can having a root canal in your mouth, is that related to any other chronic disease, such as cancer or any other chronic disease, by having a root canal that's in your mouth? And what's the chances that there's still an infection under the, the, uh, the, the, the appliance that the dentist puts in? Okay, so the, the way the sequence goes is that someone, someone gets a cavity and the cavity goes below the enamel level and goes into the area of the tooth called the pulp. And the pulp is where the blood vessels and nerves are. And when the infection breaks through into the pulp, you get inflammation and infection in the nerve. And that's a toothache. Now, the dentist at that point really has two choices. If he pulls the tooth, it ends the condition. The circulation in the tooth isn't good enough that you could say, take some amoxicillin for two weeks and it'll cure your infection. Like it might be if you had a, you know, a boil on your arm or a tonsil infection where the blood supply to these organs is good and an antibiotic or an herbal antibiotic, you know, depending on what's going on would be successful. The circulation in teeth isn't good enough. You can't get enough high enough levels in there to cure this infection that's inside the tooth and that's inflaming the nerve. So the dentist can pull it and it's over. Or what's happened in dentistry is they decided that the best thing to do would be to put a drill down in through the tooth, kill the nerve that handles the pain. In the process, the blood vessels are also killed. So now you have an organ, a tooth is bone. Now in the bone, there are tens of thousands of little canals that allow the, the blood vessels to get nutrients to the bone cells that may be on the outer edge of the tooth. And for those cells to get their waste back to the vein so that it can get out. And a tooth is really an organ. It's like a, each tooth is like a lung or an eye or a liver. It's an independent tooth. It has a nerve supply and it has a blood supply. Now, the little canals in the tooth, when the infection gets in there, those bacteria go in those little canals. And in a molar tooth, in an average molar tooth, if you put the canals together, you know, like end to end, it would be a couple of miles. So there may be a millimeter, half a millimeter long, but there's millions of them. So the bacteria go in there and they thrive in there and they like that environment. And when the, when the endodontist, the guy who does the root canal drills through, there is no way that he can sterilize those little canals. So what's left is a tooth that's dead because it has no blood supply and it's infected. Now, no area of medicine other than dentists doing root canals would leave in a dead infected organ. If a guy's got a gangrene of his toe, you have to cut it off because the body can't get medicines or antibodies or anything in there. And the poisons that are made in there will circulate back into the body and kill the person. Same thing on a bowel, like somebody gets a twisted bowel and they come in, the, it was an emergency room doctor, so they come into the emergency room with a bad belly ache and you do a CAT scan, you see, oh my gosh, the blood supply to this area of bowel is not happening. And the surgeon's gotta go in there and he's gotta take out that piece of bowel because it's dead. And so it's the same with the tooth. So 
that so that's what a root canal is. So he fills it with some stuff and it the pain ends. So the patient is happy. The tooth looks fine. So the dentist is happy and he's happy that he helped the patient and there's no more pain. But there's bacteria in there and these bacteria produce very virulent, which means very strong biotoxins. They're poisons. And these poisons block cells from being able to make energy. And those poisons come out of the root canal and they circulate through the body. And every cardiologist will tell you that deep pockets in gums is very related to heart disease. Like everybody knows that. The pockets that are formed or the bacterial products that are formed in the root canal are more intimately associated with blood vessels in the jawbone. And they can cause blocked heart arteries, heart attacks. And the acupuncturists, you know, a few thousand years ago figured out that each tooth is on one of the acupuncture meridian lines. So these are like flow lines in the body where the, in Chinese medicine, qi, where the, where the qi circulates. And what we found in our practice is that if the root canals are on the, the teeth that are associated with the breast, so these are, this is stomach meridian in acupuncture. So the breasts are on the stomach meridian. The stomach meridian teeth are the molars on the top and the premolars on the bottom. In our practice, and we see a ton of patients with breast cancer, 90% of them have root canals on the stomach teeth who have breast cancer. Hmm. Now, this is not an accident. And I'm not saying root canals cause cancer, but there's a very high association. Now, I have seen people with root canals who had chronic back pain, who had operations, who it didn't get better. And we got the root canals out and the back pain went away. And people with gallbladder disease or liver cysts, where it was associated with the liver gallbladder meridian and the tooth was infected or the tooth was abscessed and the condition cleared up. So this is a very important part that of, of people to recognize. I have a girl now who's, she's only in her 20s and she's got this diagnosis of pelvic congestion syndrome where the veins in her pelvis are collecting blood. They're not emptying properly. And she's got pelvic, chronic pelvic pain. Now she went to a surgeon who actually put a stint, a plastic little tube in the outlet veins from her pelvis and it did basically nothing. So she came to me and when I tested her, I found that she had two teeth which had areas where, there, where the wisdom teeth had been pulled and where the bone had never healed in. And there was an open pocket of the bone, we call that a cavitation. And when I tested the cavitation against her pelvic, it was actually her psoas muscle, which is a gigantic muscle that connects the lower lumbar vertebrae to the, to the femur. That's the main muscle that lifts up your leg. So when I palpated deep into her, she was very relaxed. She's very lean. It was easy to do. I put my, I put my fingers together and I just gently went down into where I could feel the psoas muscle on the left side where her pain was. And she about jumped off the table when I hit the muscle. There was a gigantic knot there. And it on the energetic testing that we do, it looks like it's associated with the tooth. I think the pelvic pain is secondary. I don't think it's pelvic congestion syndrome. I think she's got very uh, dense spasm in this muscle in her pelvis and it's giving her the pain and that we should handle the tooth and then see if that will alleviate the pain in the pelvis. And I've had hundreds of these now where this is, you know, it's just, it's, it's really finding out what's wrong with this person uh, before you do it. So I said to her, don't, because the surgeon wanted to go back in and do some more surgery. Now he wanted to embolize. He wanted to put a, he wanted to put some stuff in the veins that go to the pelvis to block them from even getting blood. And I said, it might come to this, 
But boy, that's a very invasive procedure. The last surgical procedure to put the stints in didn't do anything. And I think we ought to chase down this other thing before you go any farther, because what I'm suggesting might just do it and it won't be harmful to you. It, 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 it'll help you. You know, there's no downside to it. So, so instead of doing root canal, what's the best approach just to pull the tooth? You got to pull the tooth. And then, and then you can get an implant, you can get a bridge, um, you know, you can get a partial, um, but there just isn't any way currently that I know of that actually reliably fixes the problem. Now there's 25 million root canals done in the United States every year. This is a huge business and your average root canal is going to cost the patient somewhere between three and $4,000. So multiply that by 25 million. And then dentists who specialize in it, they do extra training, they're endodontists, there's, there's equipment. So it's a very big industry. And I don't know if you've seen it, but I was, I, I, I was involved in a film, a documentary film um, that was made called Root Cause Movie. And if anybody's interested in this area, you can just Google or go to www.rootcausemovie.com and watch this film, it's very well done. It's an Australian film producer. And uh, he came to me because he knew I was knowledgeable in this and asked if he could do a film and, and, and I was one of the presenters in it. But when the film came out, it went on Netflix and it, was, it went viral. Like the interest in this topic of people who had chronic issues and had root canals, what they, it, was, went, it went massively viral. In fact, within a month of the release of the film, we had 300 calls from people around the country hmm. who saw the film and then wanted to know, could they come and see me about helping them with their root canal? So um, the American Dental Association, because people were calling their dentist after they saw the film and like, what did you do to me? Or maybe that's what's wrong with me or la la la. That I wasn't, the, the dental association didn't like that. And they sicked their lawyers on Netflix and sent them a threat letter, which I saw, which said, this is all false. You've been lied to. None of this is true. If you keep showing this film, we're gonna sue you. And so Netflix took the film down. Wow. And now the link I gave you is to the, the film producer's website. And if you wanna watch it, you pay him six bucks or 6.99 and you can watch the film. Wow, so you talked about detoxification before. What do you feel are some of the best methods to detoxify? Well, there's a rule in toxicology. And the rule is the first thing you have to do is shut off the source of the toxins, which is bad food, bad water, bad air, not going to the bathroom, that sort of thing. So if you think you're going to detoxify and get healthy and you're eating fast food, packaged food, non-organic food. Um, don't even waste your time trying to detox because you just won't get anywhere. You also have to have pure water, like, like, like reverse osmosis water and filter your shower water. And then you can't let your gardener be putting uh, weed killer on your lawn, glyphosate on your lawn, because, the, the, um, because these are big sources of toxins. You don't want to package your food in plastics. You don't want to cook with artificial pans. I mean, you have to sort of, you want to, you want to have areas in your environment, like especially where you sleep, where there's no electronics because these are all toxins and they affect us. And so that's the first thing is you've got to just like clean up everything. Um, and then the second thing is, is that the elimination organs have to be sort of rehabilitated. Anyone who's not having at least one satisfying bowel movement a day is gonna to become toxic. That membrane in the colon has about a 24 hour window. And if you're not going every day, guess what? The, the toxins that your body's trying to eliminate are going back in. Then it has to go through it again. And what happens then is that the liver gets backed up and it can't handle it. And then you're eating jelly beans and you stopped at McDonald's for lunch and the, your lawn guy was just there and you took a couple of Tylenol because you had a headache and your liver can't process that because it's already on, I'm full, I'm overloaded. And then you get the process where these toxins start entering into cells 
into the nucleus of cells. And all these chronic diseases basically have the little factories in the cell which make energy called mitochondria. They get poisoned, then they don't make energy. The poisons get inside the DNA, then you get cancer. And so these are the, the epidemic that we have now in modern life of cancer, heart disease, hypertension, obesity, osteoporosis, ADD, autism, are all 99% environmental toxicity and then poor nutrition added on. Now, if you have root canals on top of it, worse. If you're on a lot of pharmaceutical prescriptions, prescription medicine, even worse. I'm not saying anybody stop your medicine because that could be dangerous. But once you start on this path, what we find is as we get people's bodies working, they drop their blood pressure medicine because they don't need it. And they drop their cholesterol medicine because they don't need it. And their arthritis medicine and their, you know, the average person in this country is on three or four pharmaceuticals at least. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. MacuHealth, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. So how about gen genetics? How much does genetics play a role? And can you override your genetics? Well, genetics is probably 20% and environment's probably 80%. Now I'm a good example of this. So I, my grandfather's on both sides my mother and father all had cardiovascular disease. My dad got one of the first cardiac bypasses that was done in the United States in the, in the late 60s and diabetes and obesity. And my, I have two brothers and a sister. They're, they both uh, have the same problems, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, many drugs, all this stuff. Now I don't have it. Now I have done my own genetic testing four different times. The first time I got it, I was so depressed when I saw how bad my genes were that I didn't even print out the thing because I was just like, this couldn't be, okay? Well, all three more times that I did it, hoping for a better result, were the same. So my genetic profile isn't really very good, but I'm 74. I've done 43 Ironman triathlons. I work a 60 hour week. I feel great. My memory is really good and I'm fine. And I have, you know, an 8% body fat and I don't have any of these problems. Now I'm careful, like I'm careful with my food and my environmental control and supplementation. And so I think that for most people, it's a bad excuse, plus probably laziness and non-confront on the problem that you say, well, my dad had it and, um, and therefore I have it. And interesting, the last patient I saw today was a, was a guy who came in, he'd had a couple of heart attacks and he had some stints put in and uh, he was worried about his health. And so I just saw him at an eight week visit where I, where I, we did a lot of testing on him. And he didn't tell me this on the first visit, but he told me that his dad had had to have three corneal transplants because he's got some genetic problem with his cornea and his sister and his brother had the same thing. Hmm. Now at this point, he has no symptoms and the ophthalmologist or the optometrist hasn't said anything to him, but they said to him for sure, he's 52. By the time you're 60, you're gonna have this too. And he asked me that same question. He said do you think that I'm doomed to this? And I said, I don't think you're doomed to this at all. I think if we could get you cleaned up so we optimize your circulation and your, we detoxify you when we give you the right nutrition, that you might not, you might avoid these bad genes because we've all got them where they don't turn on and cause this problem. 
and that you can live out your life with your own corneas and you don't need new ones. Is that okay to say to him? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because, you know, if he has uh, fuchs or he, ha he has uh, base membrane dystrophy, a lot of times that could be related to inflammation. And we know yeah. inflammation is the core component of chronic disease. And if we can do things to help people live longer, to control inflammation, to help their mitochondria, we hopefully could prevent those things. So that brings us to a little bit about mitochondria and what can we do? Somebody's fairly healthy. Obviously, if they have, they get cancer, they have heart disease, they just don't wake up with it one day. It's been brewing in their body for years. What could somebody do, do that says they're watching this podcast and you went over a little bit of it before, but what can they do to make sure that they're healthy and they live as healthy as life as they can, even though we're exposed to toxins and, you know, and what kind of diet, what kind of supplements do you recommend? Are you a paleo? Are you vegetarian? I think I know the answer to that, but, uh, but I, I think it's better if you explain it. Are you keto? So I think there's, I think there's some basic stuff that's good for everybody. Um, the biggest killer in the United States right now, this isn't published unless you look for it, but if you Google this term iatrogenic, so iatrogenic in Greek means doctor caused. So it's I-A-T-R-O-G-E-N-I-C. How many people died per year from iatrogenic illness, which means doctor intervention? You know, it's surgeries, it's drugs, it's, it's therapies that kill people. And about 700,000 people a year at least die from those interventions. It's higher than heart disease and it's higher than cancer. So the first big health step is decide you're going to be healthy, that your regular doctor, and I'm not poo-pooing regular doctors because someone's got a medical condition that's acute. You're having a heart attack, you go to the hospital, you get treatment. You have acute appendix, you need a C-section, you break your femur, you know, you've got very high blood pressure like you need medical intervention and you should go get it. And modern medicine is good at this stuff, but it's not the end all. It's you had an emergency, you're treating sort of a danger condition in your body to stabilize you. But now you've got to sort of look back and say, okay, how did I get in this condition and what can I do about it? Because my long-term health with polypharmacy, like too many medicines, and surgeries that aren't necessary is a real risk to people. And I don't think anybody has a, you know, they don't, they don't recognize it. Okay. Um, so I think the person first has to sort of take responsibility for their, for that. And then they have to, I, for most people in our practice, I put them on an organic paleo diet. So our ancestors for the last couple million years, were hunter gatherers and they ate what they could find and they could find animals and fish and vegetables and fruits and nuts. And that's what they ate. No processed foods, no chemicalized foods, eat organic. And then the foods that they ate were, were not in the, so the cat, so we, so when we put, when I put someone on this diet, it's sort of a combined autoimmune paleo. So I have them eat meat, fish, eggs, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. Now I take them off all grains, all legumes, and I take them off nightshade vegetables too because a lot of people have trouble with peppers and eggplants and things like that. And As dairy? A, you take them off dairy? dairy? And dairy, but they can have butter. Um, and do that for eight weeks. Almost everybody who's had constipation, diarrhea, bloating, gas, heartburn, feels better just on the diet change. So that usually helps people and they go organic and they don't eat any processed foods. If it comes in a box or a package, don't eat it, okay? Now it's a little bit of trouble to do that. It's a little bit more expensive, but you this is not expense in the way of that you're wasting money. It's an investment really in your own health and your own well being, and in your own longevity. So I have them do that. The other basic is, they have to sleep. And most people, when, when I, all the years I was doing regular medicine, I had schedules where I was varying between working all night and working all day because I had call. 
And I learned to sleep on between four and a half and five hours a night of sleep. And I could get by. And I thought I was okay. And then I invested 500 bucks in one of these little, one of these little rings, these aura rings. I don't know if you've got one. Anyway, and it gave me some feedback on my sleep. And a good score is above 85 out of 100. And a bad score is probably under 70. And my sleep scores were running in the low 50s. Okay. And I was so probably chronically tired. And I do Ironman triathlon. So I'm training. I'm doing a lot of swimming, biking, running, weightlifting, stretching. And I was doing it with this schedule anyway. And I was, it was not a wise thing for me to do. And I realized it and I said, okay, what does it take for me to get the scores in the 80 or better? And what it took is that I had to get myself in bed at 10 o'clock. I get up about quarter to five. So I had to get myself in bed so that I had 645 to seven hours of sleep a night and my scores would go up and I felt better. And I found that my performance in the races that I do got better. Like I started winning my age group and I hadn't really noticed it before. So that was important. So you dial in the food and you dial in the sleep and everybody needs to move around. You need to get some kind of exercise and hopefully it's something that you enjoy. If you like tennis or badminton, I don't consider golf really exercise, but things where you're moving and you get sweated up and you have to breathe hard are things that can help on whatever level that you can start at. You know, you, 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 you can't run a mile if, if your legs hurt after, you know, 50 steps. So people have to do it on a gradient, but those things are really important. And then people have to have a clean source of water. They got to go to the bathroom every day and there's herbals, there's fibers, there's lots of stuff to help people do that. And you've got to supplement. There's nobody that is going to get the nutrients that they need from food, from just the food these days. And I think hooking up with a functional medicine doctor, it could be a naturopath, it could be a chiropractor, it could be a nutritional counselor, it could be an MD, where they can help you sort out what are you missing in terms of nutrients and what do you need to sort of restore your organ function and your detoxification function so that you can get your body sort of back to actual a healthy condition? And um, that's going to take some lab work. Again, it's going to take some investment. Um, and it's about that simple. Now, if you've got a serious chronic illness, it's another project. So most of the people we take on, their project. And we're doing the same thing. We just have to do a lot more. Before we get to the people that are projects and we talk, I, I, what basic uh, supplements would you think that people should take even before they go and get uh, a Genova or one of these blood tests to see what they're missing? Uh, what do you think of just some basic supplements? Is it vitamin D? Is it omega-3s? Is it a good multivitamin, the amino acids? What should be the basics? Yeah, so um, I have another company. It's called Body Health. And um, I started designing supplements. It, it started because when, my, when I went to Seattle and I learned how to do metal detoxification, the program was 14 supplements. And I brought home 14 supplements. And I said to my wife, you've got to take two of each of these three times a day. <laughs> she said, I can't do that. Nobody could do that. So then I hooked up with a biochemist and I tried to design a multivitamin where about 10 of them could be in there of things that everybody need. So it's, a, it's in, a, it's in a, a, a base of 16 organic whole food fruits and vegetables. Now to that, we added some extra vitamin C and CoQ10 and activated folate and K, uh, vitamin K2. And you know, the, if you'd source these separately, which many people do, it's, it's four or five extra bottles at 50 bucks a bottle. And this multi is $59. So it's a, and it's only two tablets twice a day. So it's really good. So I can, I, so everybody I see, they go on that. Virtually or very few people are, are getting enough fruits and vegetables. It takes about eight to 10 servings a day to keep your blood level of antioxidants sufficient to deal with the environment that we're in. Now, raise your hand, everybody who's listening. 
How many of you are eating eight to 10 servings of fruit and vegetables every day? Well, we tested this in my practice. Now, if you're drinking something like, like what Carrie's drinking, it's that's- a, a Juice, a vegetable juice. Yes, so that, that counts, okay? Mm -hmm. So we did a test where we, for, for everyone that came in the clinic for two months, we had this machine that would measure your antioxidant levels, your carotenoid levels. Oh, the Pharmanex machine? Pharmanex machine. Yes. So I rented a Pharmanex machine from them. This is probably 10 years ago. Okay. And I took a lease on it for a couple of months and every person that walked in my office got tested. Now, according to Pharmanex, if your level's above 50, you have adequate antioxidant status. And that's 10, eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. In my practice, and most of the people that are coming to me are fairly conscious about food. The average was 18. And the children that we saw, the average was 12. So I put together my own mixture of a green, a greens and reds drink. And one spoonful was 10 servings. And I said, take one scoop of this every day for the next month and then come back and let's measure your antioxidant levels and see if that fixed you. And 100% of them were above 50. So that's an easy fix. Take a concentrated... Can you get that? Is that available still from Body Health? Yeah, so we have a greens and a reds. They're delicious. You can throw them on, you know, if in, in smoothies, you can take them in a glass of, you know, you can take them in a glass of water or almond milk or whatever you like to drink. And they're delicious and they, they're, they, they really work. And how can people get that if they, if they're interested, they want to get the body health, uh, just greens, or, go to bodyhealth.com. Great. So let me Thank ask you about mitochondria. You know, if you're getting sick, your mitochondria is getting sick and that's kind of making you sick. Uh, if you would agree with that, uh, Explain to us about the importance of mitochondria. How can we test it? Can VO2 max help us? Is it serum? Is it urine? How can we test of our, uh, about our, our mitochondria? Okay. So in every cell in the body, there are these little factories. There are these little organs that take the oxygen that we breathe and the food that we eat and turn it into chemical energy turns it into a, a, a molecule called ATP, which is able to store the energy from that interaction of oxygen and food. And in every cell, there's an average of between 1,000 and 2,000 mitochondria. In the heart, there's like 10,000. In the retina, there's like, I think, 50,000. In the, in the egg that that is... When it mates with the sperm, there's a hundred thousand mitochondria because they got to have enough energy to build the whole body. You know, the sperm contributes DNA, but basically nothing else. So the egg has to have been close enough. So these things are in our bodies. Now, in order for them to work, they have to get oxygen, they have to get food. And when the with the toxin load is cut, and so a healthy cell can make energy. All disease, if you wanted to reduce it, and I don't care if it's Alzheimer's or cancer or polio, it's the energy system in the cell is inadequate to be able to deal with the waste and make the energy. Like it is the bottom line. Now, the mitochondria require certain nutrients, so you have to get the stuff in that you need. And one of the biggest problems is that when, when we're exposed to these environmental toxins, they get into the mitochondria and they, they, they toxify it, they mess with it so that the mitochondria can't make energy. You know, back in, 19, in the 1920s, late 1920s, there was a guy named Otto Warburg. He was an MD, PhD, he was, he's German, won the Nobel Prize because what he figured out is that the problem with a cancer cell was that the mitochondria were so toxic that they could no longer use oxygen to make energy. And there is a fallback system in the cell where the cell can make energy on another chemical process. It's called fermentation. It's very inefficient. 
if a, if a, if a mitochondria makes energy with oxygen, it can produce 38 of these ATP molecules with each go around of the cycle. When it's not using oxygen, it can only make two of them. And that's what a cancer cell is. A cancer cell is a cell that's the mitochondria are so damaged that it can't make energy. And the damage could come from viruses and infections plus toxins. And so the cell can't make energy and it becomes a, a kind of a crazy cell where it multiplies out of control and it tries to take over the body. So making energy is the key. And if you have good vitality and energy, you have good mitochondria. Now, we have a test in the office where we can actually measure people's mitochondria. We can, we can measure their resting metabolism. We can measure how much oxygen they breathe in and then how much of it they actually use. Because if your mitochondria are damaged, you can breathe oxygen in but you don't utilize it. So we can measure that. And then we put them on an exercise bike and we can measure how much oxygen they can actually use. And you mentioned VO2 max. So VO2 max is how much, how much oxygen can the body maximally use? Now, in someone who's probably everybody's had this experience where you pushed yourself to the point where you were so breathless, that you couldn't do any more. And at that point, you had out exercised your body's ability to utilize oxygen and the body went to this other system and then you had to stop because you couldn't, you couldn't keep up. And what happens with that is that if you have really good mitochondria, like the best performance athletes, endurance athletes, you know, might have a, a, a VO2 max in the low nineties, high eighties, you know, the cyclists and the cross country skiers and the swimmers, they're very high because they have very, their mitochondria work very well. In someone who's sick, who's got chronic fatigue and you measure their VO2 max, it might be eight, nine. And when they start to move, their VO2 max is so low mm. that they're basically breathless trying to get out of bed to walk to the bathroom. Now, this isn't a psychological condition. This is so polluted biochemistry that the thing is barely alive. And so then what, we're, what we have to do then is fix that, you know, like get the toxins out and replace the nutrients. And when they're very sick, it's, it, you can only go slow. You, can, you have to go slow because they're, they, they can't take much. You know, they're, they're, they're very delicate, but in most people, unless they're just too far gone, you can make progress. And if they're dedicated to it, some people it's three or four weeks and some people it's six months. Most of the people we see in the clinic within three or four months, we get them on their feet. They can go back to work. They can remember, they can think. And so that's the, that's sort of the, the, the what we're doing. It's, it's, it's being able to get this system working again, the biochemistry working. How about organic acid tests, looking for lactate, pyruvate? Yeah, so pyruvate and lactate, these are, so these organic acids give you windows in which areas is the system broken and where there may be nutrients that you can supplement to help sort of push those systems. So yeah, so we do, we, that's part of the testing that we do on people. Um, is to get these labs and see, you know, what, what, you know, what are their levels of minerals? A lot of people are mineral deficient. They're magnesium and potassium and molybdenum and zinc and selenium, you know, they're deficient. And these things are very important in energy generation and they, they don't generate energy if they don't have these things in their body or enough. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicel technology. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields 
acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also going to be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Well, Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.